Foreign Minister, welcome. Pleasure to have you on. Let me ask you, you represent a new government uh, in Iran, um, in many ways uh, seems different from the last one. Certainly watching the campaign, you were very critical of the last government. Um, what is this new government's foreign policy and how does it differ from the last one? In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, the doctoring of the foreign policy of the new administration in Iran is based on uh, a balanced foreign policy, a dynamic and active uh, diplomacy, and a smart uh, interaction with uh, all the parties in the foreign policy of the new administration of Iran, we have put on our agenda the development of our uh, ties with uh, all the parts in the world, the East and the West. But in prioritizing, uh, we are t taking a special look at our neighbors in Asia. It's a special attention we are paying to our neighbors in Asia. But also, as an important country in the Asian continent, we are also having a special attention towards Asia. We believe that the 21st century is the century that belongs to Asia. But also maintaining relations with the West, with the African continent, all parts of the world, and developing our political and diplomatic ties with Europe, and on all the countries in the West, they are also parts of our uh, balanced foreign policy, and we are paying serious attention to them. So let me ask you about the burning issue at hand, um, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Iran has often said that one of the consistent themes of its foreign policy is it does not uh, condone aggression. It does not condone the changing of borders by force. Um, you were yourself victim of Saddam Hussein's aggression. Why is the Iranian government reluctant to come out clearly and simply and condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Regarding uh, Ukraine, first of all, what happened there, the war and the, the military Operation. It was something that we strongly condemned. Even the supreme leader of Iran at the highest level in the Islamic Republic of Iran clearly and in publicly declared that we are opposed to war. As we are... Uh, oh. Sir, being opposed to war is different from condemning the country that began the war. What I'm looking for is a simple statement that says you condemn Russia for beginning the war. We all oppose war. But do you, do you condemn Russia for starting the war? As we condemn the war against uh, Ukraine, and we believe it is not uh, appropriate, also war against Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, and Palestine. We believe that war is inappropriate everywhere. But Ukraine, there is this reality. The United States and NATO, they were uh, involved in provocative actions in the region. I think the, what is, the, 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 there were provocations done by the United States and NATO in, uh, in order to justify their presence and also their enlargement and provoke a Kremlin into this. This is a reality that has to come to our attention. But, but the, so, the solution, uh, for that, is it war? No. We uh, support uh, dialogue and diplomacy. I, I have to talk twice with Mr. Lavrov, also the Ukrainian foreign minister. Last week, I, I, I proposed to Mr. Lavrov that we are ready to host uh, both of you, Ukraine and Russia. War has to come to an end, and those Ukrainian uh, displaced people and this humanitarian tragedy, it, it pains every human being's heart. And I hope that our efforts will be will help to bring the war to a halt and help the political process 
and we don't have any double standard, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Yemen, anywhere in the world. If the human rights are violated, anywhere there is war and aggression, we are opposed to it and we condemn it. The Russian foreign minister take you up on your offer because Russia does not seem at all interested in negotiating right now. It's in, it's in, it continues to fight and take territory from Ukraine. You know, Mr. Fariz Zakaria, where the problem is, Russia is blaming Ukraine that uh, Ukraine is not uh, after uh, negotiations and the stop of the war. And Ukraine is doing the same and accusing Russia of the same thing. But I am of the belief that we should all try uh, so that you, uh, the Ukrainian war will come to an end as soon as possible and that the, the problems will be settled between Russia and Ukraine through political dialogue that is affecting vastly the whole world. Let me ask you about uh, the, the uh, so-called Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. Um, Rob Malley, the American official who is in charge of uh, handling that portfolio, said recently that the, the prospects for the deal uh, being re renewed are tenuous at best, fragile, uh, uh, cast doubt that it would happen. Do you share that view, that the Iran nuclear deal is unlikely to come back into force? Just, just like the Foreign Minister of the U United States, the Foreign Secretary, and also Mr. Rob Malley, I, I, I am facing a lot of pressure coming from my parliament. They, they, they are strong people um, inside both countries that are against uh, the, the revival of JCPOA for, for their own reasons. Of course, we are receiving messages from Rob Malay and some, some of the officials of the United States at the highest level, Mr. Biden himself, that are a little bit different uh, uh, from what we hear from them, the, the, the public statements that they make. Uh, it is understandable to me that Mr. Mo, uh, Rob Malay is also considering uh, domestic purposes. And you know we know how he's speaking before the Congress. But what we are exchanging messages through non-papers, through Mr. Enrique Mora or Mr. Borrell of the EU, or some of the foreign ministers uh, in Europe, in my region, there are messages that are exchanged between us from the beginning of the new rounds of talks in order to uh, uh, revive JCPOA and bring them back to their commitments, the, the parties, the Islamic Republic of Iran has uh, put on the table uh, different initiatives. Recently, uh, we put on the negotiating table uh, a new initiative, but we think that Mr. Uh, Biden is uh, facing some kind of inaction. Uh, I hope that the, the American side will act and behave realistically, the, the subjects is important to us. The most important thing is that uh, in, the, in the return of all the parties to JCPOA, uh, we need to, we need to uh, benefit from the economic gains of JCPOA. The, the elements of the Trump's uh, uh, maximum uh, uh, pressure policy should be removed. This is something that Mr. Biden said from the very beginning of his presidential campaign. You cannot return to JCPOA, but at the same time, Iran will be deprived of its uh, uh, economic gains. You cannot return to JCPOA, but the elements and the factors of Trump's maximum pressure policy are still there. Mr. Uh, Biden has to choose one of these. He has to decide. Uh, we are very serious about reaching a strong and good and lasting deal, and we are committed to it. Uh, our nuclear program is totally peaceful. This is the American side that has to make the decision. We are keeping the, the window of diplomacy open, and we hope that uh, if the Americans have a realistic approach, we, we will get to the point where we can make the deal. But Mr. Fari Zakaria, I have to say that uh, with uh, some regret that the national interests of the United States have been taken hostage by the Zionists. There are so many reasons to believe so. Let me ask you about the what, what is reported to be the central issue that is the obstacle now, the designation of the IRGC as a terrorist organization, the Iranian Republican Guards. Um, 
it seems to me from the outside that this is an issue outside of the nuclear deal. Um, in other words, there are things that Iran or the Revolutionary Guard have done uh, which are, which are, um, have triggered this designation, rightly or wrongly, but they have nothing to do with the Iran nuclear deal. So why allow the issue of the Revolutionary Guard to interfere with whether or not you, pers you, you go ahead with the, the deal? If, uh, as a person who is responsible for our di uh, diplomacy team and negotiating team, uh, honestly, uh, what, what is the, the hurdle, what, what has caused the pause, should I say, or a cessation in, in the talks is that uh, economic guarantees, we have not come uh, to the point where we can trust the American side. The, we have not been convinced yet that uh, if uh, on the ground and in action, we have not been convinced that we have not seen a, a behavior that is different from Trump's approach. You see, we should not diminish things or reduce them to just one subject. FTO thing is, is just one level of our talks between us and the Americans indirectly. But before that, there are still remaining issues which are also important. We say that uh, we say that the return to JCPOA is that we should uh, the economic, uh, natural economic and trade activities of Iran uh, should become normal and natural uh, in the international sphere. This is important to us. We should be able to do so, and we have said this to the American side. But unfortunately, this FTO thing. The Israeli side uh, made it public, magnified it, and now this issue is being portrayed as the main hurdle. This is why I'm telling you clearly that the main obstacle is that we are not convinced that uh, the people of Iran and we are going to benefit fully from the economic uh, gains of JCPOA. Because this is an important uh, point. You're saying that if you had confidence that the U.S. would, in fact, uh, wa waive, remove the sanctions that were put in place uh, by Trump and, and, and as part of the, his pulling out of the Iran uh, deal, that, would, that, that is the, the core issue. You would not let the designation of the Revolutionary Guard as a foreign terrorist organization uh, become the obstacle. Uh, you see... Mr. Zakaria, uh, since last September, uh, when I was in New York, and um, also recently in the Munich Security Conference, and also on, on the path of, of the indirect talks uh, between my colleague, uh, Dr. Bagheri, and uh, Mr. Enrique Mora, and uh, unofficial exchange of uh, messages, we are facing repeatedly this request from the United States. Let's see. Let's sit down and talk directly and settle the remaining issues, including FTO. I have said that if Mr. Biden is, you know, he's he's giving us messages. If he really has good intentions, and if his intentions are genuine, Mr. Biden should show this uh, on the ground. They ask me how is. Do you expect him to show this? You just. Take a look at JCPOA. Okay, uh, we, we we are we are having these big nuclear uh, achievements. We have to bring them to a halt. What is the, uh, the United States going to do ultimately? They have uh, uh, imposed sanctions on us, and they have frozen their assets. They are not going to pay anything from us from their own pockets. They are just going to release uh, our own assets, things that were that are rightfully. Hours. They are going to return them to us. They are not going to pay anything from their own pockets. At the, the best scenario, this is going to happen. So uh, we told them, if you're talking about direct talks, then you have to prove to us that you're different from uh, uh, President Trump. There is a difference between Biden and Trump. You have to show it to us in practice. 
what we are still feeling yeah, that uh, the, the, the maximum pressure policy of the Trump is, is still being repeated by Biden. There are still important issues remaining, but we are but they are just we, we want to make it simple. Okay, you have good intentions. You claim you have good intentions. We are ready. Give us economic guarantees and remove the elements of the maximum uh, pressure policy of Trump. If you remove these, these are the important issues that are the most important issues to us that we have to focus on. But in the hue and cry of the media, there are things that are raised which are not right. Let me ask you, um, when, when, when you look at relations between the United States and Iran, um, is, there, is there, in your view, a path to um, a real rapprochement, better relations? Um, you, you know, you are, you're still representing a country that chants every year, <coughs> death to America, that still has slogans uh, plastered on, on the walls, painted by the government, sponsored by the government that say death to America. Um, do you want to have better relations with America? Usually, when a new administration comes into power, whether in Iran or in the US, the first thing that is raised is uh, how, how, um, how the relationship between Tehran and Washington going to be. We have said this all the time, that uh, we have this uh, specific and clear uh, principle in our foreign policy. Secondly, and the, re the issue of the uh, relationship between Iran and the US, the criterion is the behavior of the American side. Uh, and over the last uh, 40 years, a lot of indicators uh, have been given to us by the United States that make us uh, distrust them. You see, right now, we are involved in intensive Vienna talks, but they are imposing fresh sanctions against Iran by uh, Mr. Biden's team with his uh, signature against some real entities of Iran or some organizations in Iran. Mr. Zakaria. Or maybe for you or for the viewers or the audience here, it, it might be interesting to know that the, the Americans they have been so extreme in, in sanctions that sometimes that sometimes a person's name has been repeated three times. This is why the person passed away 10 years ago. He doesn't exist anymore. This is like a mania, a sanction mania that the US is facing. Uh, in order for a relationship between Iran and Washington to get uh, to return to normalcy, we are going to decide about it based on the behavior of the U.S. And it is important for any kind of dialogue to have at least some semblance of trust between the two sides. If you return to the the, the deal, um, and you know this question is being asked in the context of Russian oil potentially being more 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 difficult to get. Uh, if you were to return to the deal, how much oil could Iran pump out uh, a day? First of all, you know that the Islamic Republic of Iran has uh, a lot of diverse potentialities uh, in, the, in the field of energy, including petrochemicals, oil and gas, and also geo uh, politically and economically in the area of transit, east to the west, north to the south, we are we are enjoying very good infrastructures and very good capacities. I I think the capacities of the Islamic Republic of Iran, especially uh, in the post-COVID era, can come to the serious attention of the whole world. Uh, less than three uh, months ago, we we had the we had the Doha summit, uh, a kind of gas OPEC, and my president set forth an initiative there. He said that the opportunity of gas uh, should be should be utilized in order to uh, mend the, the economic shape of the world in an appropriate way and uh, amongst all the producers and ex exporters and the consumers of gas in order to revive the, econom uh, the, the global economy, uh, we, we set forth 
and uh, propose very good ideas in that event. But the Southern Republic of Iran, uh, when it when it comes to trade and economy, we have to get back uh, to our natural status and standing. Uh, and naturally, we don't want to replace others or compete with others. We just we just want to use this capacity to help uh, the, the, the global economy, both in energy and transit. Uh, let me ask you about your relations with uh, the other big uh, country in the Middle East with which you have had tense relations, Saudi Arabia. Um, the Saudi foreign minister says that there is a, a, a new opening is possible, um, or some words to that effect. Do you believe Saudi-Iranian relations are moving in a in a, a, a strikingly positive direction? Some days ago, I was in United Arab Emirates. Uh, Mr. Mohammed bin Zayed, and in the new chief of UAE, I told him that a lot of things can change, but geography cannot change. The, the things that we have in common, they cannot change. You see, Iran and Saudi Arabia are two major important countries in the region, two influential countries in the region. Uh, we we didn't uh, totally sever our diplomatic ties in a retaliatory move. It was the uh, start of the n new rule of Mr. Malik Salman that it, it made a decision based on, it wasn't a kind of uh, emotional one and severed ties with Iran, not based on logics. But we have always remained, uh, we have always kept the doors open uh, and if the Saudi Arabia is interested in that, to bring it to a normalcy, we, we will uh, welcome it. Of, uh, yeah. Have they been more positive in recent months? Uh, I think in recent talks, especially in the last round that we held, we made good progress. We also, we even agreed that in the near future, at the at the level of some officials at the foreign ministers or even the foreign ministers we can have uh, uh, some meetings in a third country or in in a in, in a place that is agreed upon mutually uh, the progress is uh, minimal but good i think so far made good progress uh, i think that if if the saudi arabia uh, moves more rapidly, then uh, our relationship can be put back on the normal path. We do welcome this, the return of our uh, relations uh, to a normal state, and we hope that we will have the, the participate with the participation of all the countries of the region, and uh, as a result of which we will have uh, more peace and st stability in the in, in that very important region of the Middle East. Specifically uh, in what has often been called the, the world's worst humanitarian crisis, certainly at, until Ukraine, was, was Yemen. Um, millions of people on the verge of starvation because of a war in which Saudi Arabia backs one side, Iran backs the other. Is there going to be a, um, a deal? Uh, can, do you think you and Saudi Arabia will be able to come to a deal to permanently end that conflict? We, uh, with regards with regards to Yemeni developments, we have always been on the positive side, and we believe that all the parties, all the Yemeni parties, uh, should play the role in the future of the Yemen, not just one faction or one current or one group. Of course, Ansarullah and his allies in the capital and the north of Yemen, the, uh, over the past years, they have been able to stand against an aggression 
and uh, somehow establish the safest regions against the terrorists. In the, in the south, uh, they, uh, they were facing a lot of terrorist um, attacks. So we, in the very beginning, we thought that we, we, we declared that the, the start of the war was something wrong, and we believe that the ceasefire has to go on, and the human blockade of Yemen should be totally removed. All the Yemeni parties should sit around the table and and decide for the future of their country. We do welcome the, the continuation of the ceasefire and any progress in those areas. Um, let me ask you about a report that's been out recently about um, uh, something that happened 20 years ago in Iran, but it's still important, which is uh, the report says that Iran obtained uh, secret documents uh, from the uh, secret IAEA documents, international Atomic Energy Agency, and used them to systematically and intentionally lie to the weapon uh, to the inspectors to conceal its nuclear program. I ask this because, of course, so much of this agreement depends on trust, and uh, this is the kind of thing that makes people very wary of trusting Iran. Um, Unfortunately. The Zionists are spreading a lot of lies. This is a scenario that has been repeated uh, many times uh, before. It is fabricated uh, 20 years ago. The Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister of the Zionist regime claimed that Iran, Iran is going to have access to nuclear bomb in less than one year. 20 years later, we have said this many times that it is not in our beliefs. It is. N it has no place in our uh, doctrine, in our defense or uh, uh, foreign policy. Nucle nukes have no place. After 20 years, uh, a lot of inspections are carried out by IAEA. And, and they have said that I Iranians are not after developing a nuclear bomb. But the Zionist regime is repeating this lie in different uh, fashions. Yes, in JCPOA, we come to the point that if the American side decides realistically, then the deal is at hand. But this is something that the Zionists don't want to happen. That is why they're coming up with these stories, these tales. Uh, let me uh, quickly ask you about another hotspot in the region. There are so many. One, we could go on for another half hour. but. Um, what do you think is going to happen in Syria? Uh, Assad is firmly in control, but in firmly in control of only a part of, of, his, of what was Syria. What is going to happen? What is happening in those other parts, and how will this issue get resolved? Or will, will Syria essentially permanently be divided now? You know that. In less than two or three weeks, Mr. Bashar Assad, the president was in Tehran. You know that uh, in the war against the terrorists in Syria, we helped Syria. We helped the people of Syria. We didn't allow the terrorists to become rulers in Syria if Daesh or ISIS uh, would be brought into power in Syria or in Iraq. The world would be different now. We do believe that when it comes to Syria, uh, there has to be a focus on the political dialogue and political solution. Yes, in Edlib, in Aleppo, uh, in Edlib, the, the the terrorists are deposed there. They are stationed there, and they have the support of the Americans. When I was the deputy uh, foreign minister in Iran, and I was in charge of uh, the the file of Syria. They were, they were uh, uh, making use of the United Nations uh, tools uh, so that there will be no harm to the terrorists. That they, they were parts of the strategy of the United States. This, likewise, in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, intelligence shows that the making an instrumental use of the terrorism is one of the methods that is the, uh, used by the intelligence services of the United States, is still doing so. Despite the fact that uh, they're in the media, they're saying that they're fighting against the ter terrorists, 
but they are not in practice in Syria. They have to, they have, it has to be made, make clear what kind of country accepts that uh, one of its m biggest uh, provinces will become a haven for the terrorists? No country. Number two, the foreign occupation of some parts of Syria should come to a stop. And on the path of interaction and dialogue, the people of Syria should be able to decide about their future. We are, we, are, we, we are against the presence of terrorists in Syria. And at the same time, we believe that through dialogue and political process and getting away from the foreign interferences, people should be brought in so that they can decide for the future. And this is something that we support, the decision made by the people of Syria. Let me finally, we're, we're, we're out of time, but I just want one clarification on this very crucial issue of the uh, Revolutionary Guards and the deal. So my understanding is that whether or not the Revolutionary Guard are designated as foreign terrorist organization makes no difference practically. Uh, Iran is in any case under, under sanctions uh, and has from the United States from the 1980s. There is no additional sanction that comes with that. There's no additional curtailment of e activity. It's a purely symbolic issue. So why would you let that uh, distract you from whether or not you can get back into the deal? Is that to think about it? I think, first of all, the Americans know very well that if they want to return to JCPOA, what is it that they need to do? They know very well, full well, what it is required from them. President Biden knows very well, understands very well. What does it, what does it require? Just the economic? He knows very well what he should do. The most important thing is that the economic sanctions need to be lifted in an effective way. The most important thing is that the maximum pressure policy of the uh, Trump era, the factors, the elements there need to be removed. We are not asking for much, but reducing these fundamental things to just one subject and focusing on it, I think I think this is not a good behavior. This is not a good reaction. The Americans know very well what the realities are, what is happening on the ground, and what they should do. We have kept the window of diplomacy open, and in order to reach a good and lasting deal, we are determined, we are serious about it. And it has been us, the Iranian side, that has put initiatives on the table and helped the window of uh, diplomacy open. But uh, let me be uh, frank with you. We have intelligence that the Zionist, the Zionist regime, they have uh, taken the foreign policy of the US hostage. The interest of the US hostage, Mr. Biden should make the decision. Does he really want to kill the time, waste the time, or does he want to be brave and stay true to the commitments, obligations of the United States under JCPOA? We have been the most serious and most honest, and we have done the most accurate things. But now it is the, Amer uh, the United States that has to make the decision. And I think if the Zionist lobby Uh, distances itself uh, from the national interests of the U.S. just a little. Mr. Biden will be able to make uh, the decision required for reaching a good deal. But if it doesn't happen, you know, in Iran in the last 40 years, we have uh, withstood these pressures and we have other options on the table as well. So thank you for the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you.